This is a production of Cornell University Library. And thank you all for coming. This is a totally different context for me. And so I was saying earlier that I can walk into any room and just teach, but this is so different for me. I haven't done this before. So I'm excited about it and excited to share. Um, so my book is Work Life Fusion, and it's based on much of my research. I've already had a fantastic introduction, but let me just skip to the bottom here and say that the research that I do is, is very much in uh, the realm of a practitioner scholar. So I like to make sure that what I'm doing is actionable and something that I can share with everyone so that the results of my research um, can make the world a better place. So that's really my goal. Um, writing the book was really that labor of love. Um, I've published in research publications before, but I wanted to make sure that what I was finding out actually landed where it was supposed to, which is in organizations. Um, after all, my, um, my degree is in management and designing sustainable systems, and we all know the word sustainability relates to things like the environment, but I felt like a sustainable system is also um, includes people. And so to have a sustainable system in an organization, we need to have successful interactions, and we all need to be able to relate to one another because um, individuals as groups are their own system. And so that was my goal. So here's how I started. Um, I've always been fascinated with people. I think many of us are. We're people watchers. And my fascination of people um, brought me into the educational arena. And I was watching people of all different ages interacting. And I, I once watched a 65-year-old student teaching a 17-year-old student from the inner city um, to use a computer because he had grown up without computers. And it was this amazing, um, it was a change. It wasn't something that I expected to see. I expected this young kid who maybe grew up with technology to be showing this man who came back to school how to use the computer. And, and the mentoring was so beautiful. And I saw a lot of scenarios like that. I saw young people mentoring older people, older people mentoring younger people. And I thought to myself, how is this going to transform itself or transfer into organizations where we're going to have a lot of people working together, right? And we're all so different. Um, so I started with a qualitative study, and I talked to managers who were 35 years old or younger who had direct reports who were 20 plus years older than they were. So what I was looking for was that reverse dynamic in terms of the parent-child relationship. How does it work when you get to work and you're not the child anymore? You're now the leader, and you have these individuals reporting to you. And the interviews were qualitative, so we talked a lot, and I transcribed the research. And what I found was that people were talking a lot about what I called these perceptual collisions. They were um, not recognizing how other people were seeing the world, and therefore they were struggling to interact with one another. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of talk started to surface around work-life balance and what that was. So we had Gen Xers and, and Boomers and traditionals uh, talking about how they got their work-life balance. And then we had millennials getting in trouble because that really wasn't something that was on their radar. They were kind of doing everything at one time. Um, so I decided to test that quantitatively. So I put together a few instruments. I don't want to get too researchy here because my whole book is all about not being too researchy. Um, my co-author prompted me. She said, your, your research is so interesting, but you need it to be interesting enough that everybody wants to read about it, not just th this journaly looking jargon that's in here. And so um, she prompted me to do that. So I'll be short on that. But what we looked at was, how are people leveraging technology at work? So I sort of accidentally ended up looking at the generations, because I really was interested in people, how they were behaving in the organizations, and what they were doing with technology. And so I spent about two weeks with my findings and uh, my research data, and I had no findings until I broke it up into generations, and I realized that the boomers and the millennials were actually canceling each other out in terms of results. And, and then my study really, really had interesting information in it. And I'll get into that in a minute. So I looked at how we're leveraging technology, what, and then what is it used for? So my next study was, OK, now we know that people of different generations are leveraging technology differently in the workplace. And they're using a lot of this technology to manage their work and their life at different times. 
but now what tools are they actually using at different times? And, and the, um, the book is really a culmination of all three of those things. Um, so how I did this was um, in an engaged scholarship way, which is to improve communities. And um, I tried to use my little trifecta here of generations by taking my research, having it written and edited by a millennial and then reviewed by a boomer. And, that's, and it's also three generations in my family, so that worked out great. So this is what I ended up with. I ended up with the importance of generational diversity. We're, we're all so different, and now there are so many of us. There's five generations sharing the workplace. The fifth generation is probably still at Panera and McDonald's, and you know they're not actually in corporate yet, um, but they're on their way. And so we need to figure out a way for us to all understand each other. Um, what I have found is that age really does impact how we approach our tasks, the way we do things, and how we approach our relationships. And that matters when we're all in the same environment interacting with each other because when we're approaching things differently, there are some disconnects. Not just some, there are a lot of disconnects. Um, we're leveraging the technology differently. And so our norms are different per group. So there's all these individual generational systems and our norms are different. And so we're kind of missing each other. And it could be something as simple as, I remember many years ago, probably 25 years ago, realizing that some people were sending emails while other people were checking their phones for voicemails. And it was a simple matter of, I'm waiting for a voicemail, but you're sending an email and I'm not on email. So that would be th probably the simplest form of, there's a disconnect here. I'm approaching it one way, but you're expecting me to communicate with you in a different way. And so these, these types of collisions are abound. So my goal has become <coughs> to blend human systems so that we can all understand each other um, embrace the differences so we can kind of move ahead and determine the best way to include everybody because those positive interactions are what breed uh, great relationships at work, which breeds really strong teamwork, really successful teams. Um, and it also, um, a supportive technological environment at work makes us happy. It actually helps us to feel free and autonomous in what we're doing when we're not restricted. So I'm just going to go back and do the basics here. Um, there's actually a few things on here. No matter where you go, you're going to see the, the years changing a little bit. Um, so what I focused on was uh, boomers. I, I did do the silent generation, but there weren't enough people in my study to be statistically significant, so I did not include the results. I couldn't. And what I did, ended up doing was do, uh, looking at baby boomers, Generation X, and millennials. I don't know what zennials are. I don't know what this is. I've never seen it before. But mainly these years are pretty close to what I've used. And these are our, our new folks coming up. They're called Gen Z. I have to wait a few more years before I can relaunch my study and add them in. I can't wait to do that. But I'm really curious to see if the, um, the differences in the technology today are uh, more or less impactful than they were previously. So the years that I use are up at the top here, and I'm not going to go over these slides. I just want to review with you what we already know. We read in magazines. We hear in news reports, et cetera. And these are the basic years that I follow. And what's really interesting about these slides are things like the optimism. So I, I mainly compare the boomers and the millennials. Gen Xers are, we're pretty, vers I'm a Gen Xer, we're pretty versatile. Um, and I will talk about us, but um, the boomers and the millennials seem pretty diametrically opposed. And so it's really fun to compare those because if you're in a workplace where both of these um, groups are trying to interact, it's, it's almost comical when you, we start to look at it. Um, but what I like is the realism and the, the social. The, the word social is really important here, right? Um, that's a big one, and it kind of goes with the social media concept. Um, other things, none of these are really different. I think the optimism and the real versus the, the social are important. But these are lifestyle characteristics, which more impactful, and a lot more words, is the workforce characteristics. And again, I'm not going over all of them, but the work ethic is important to look at. Key words that are really true today and things that I have found are the baby boomers' difference with desire for quality versus the multitasking. 
approaching how we get the work done is significantly different. And you'll hear really interesting stories in the workplace where um, someone who is not a millennial will say, oh my gosh, this, this person, this employee is doing so many things at once, but they're not getting anything done well. And then you'll hear a millennial say in the workplace, oh my gosh, so-and-so only gets five things done in a day. He is so slow, not realizing that that person is focused on doing a quality job because we kind of grew up in the age of total quality management. So, and neither one of those is wrong. And my emphasis is always when we have a perceptual collision or we don't understand someone, we say, you don't do that like me. That must be wrong because it's uncomfortable for us. It's why we, we say birds of a feather flock together, right? It's that similar to me makes us more comfortable. And then we try to make sense out of why this person is doing it a different way. And generally, no matter who you are, you try to make sense out of the difference by helping them to understand why they've done it wrong. That this human nature. And so we see that with um, tasks, and we also see that with relationships. If you think about um, the older generations, we had fewer friends, but they were these in-depth relationships, and we were more likely to have in-depth relationships with our coworkers versus um, the younger generations have many, many relationships. Neither one of those is a wrong thing, right? The, the millennials are master networkers. They have a lot of people. They know a lot of people in a lot of different areas. Um, it's just that the, and this is statistically, this is not I am calling you out and saying that you are this way because this is just a statistically significant outcome. It doesn't mean everyone is this way. So these are the things that prompted me to kind of move forward. Um, work is fulfillment. So for, for millennials now, we're starting to see a lot more of these um, community engaged careers. They really need to be on a passion project when they're doing their work. And that goes to engagement, but I think it's important to note that because I think that that sort of lends itself to that social, that, that feeling of being socially connected. Uh, leadership style is another interesting one. And it says on here, this is not my slide, I, I took it. And so I'll tell you the things that I agree and disagree with. Um, the leadership style where it says remains to be seen, well, that was my first study. And it's pretty interesting because millennials will go in at technology and just figure it out. They're hardwired to just, I know I can probably do this with the technology. I'm going to figure this out. What was interesting is when I was interviewing the millennial leaders, they said that the people that were reporting to them, no matter what age they were, seemed to need a lot more um, help getting things done. And so the mentality for the younger leader was that, well, you should just go figure that out. But, but if you think about the traditional or the, um, the way that boomers and Gen Xers went through the workplace, that flow was all about development and mentoring. And so there's, there was starting to be a little disconnect between, well, my leader's not mentoring me. And the other one, the, 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 old, the younger leaders are saying, well, you can figure that out. Google it, right? <laughs> Just Google it. So that's another interesting one. Um, so leadership, development versus figure it out. Um, so my favorite one on this page at the bottom, and I read this in a magazine once, is the work and family life. If you start at Boomers, it says, we live to work. And then the Gen Xers work to live. And then it says, I've got another gig. And it's really kind of funny, because I, I disagree with the, the word balance here, because I've actually studied it, and it's not really a balance. Um, but I think it's funny that it's, I've got another gig, because it, it just goes to how you feel about uh, work and family life and what is most important to you. And as we, we work through this, you'll see that um, the I've got another gig is really more indicative of the fact that the primary connection needs to be the family life or the, the, the social. So this is where I'm at and how the book came about. Um, it's the premise that tasks and relationships are different and they change how we manage our work and our life. And certainly, these are distinctly characterized by generation and our exposure to technology. So it's sort of its own little trifecta there. 
Um, so we used to do the balance, and, and many of us still do the balance. And even though we could balance if we wanted to, we could get to work and turn everything off, and many people choose to do that. Um, everyone, people of all ages, are leveraging the technologies so that they can check in with what's going on. So there's, there's this movement toward a, a fused environment in terms of work and life uh, because it's convenient versus preferred. And what I'm going to talk about is what, what things and what groups of people are stressed out or feeling like they lack freedom and autonomy at work if they cannot get to certain technologies or get to or check in on personal life versus those of us who are using the technologies because it's, it's there and we can use it and it's very convenient. Um, but if it wasn't there, perhaps we could do without because we've done that before. What we're doing now is this. We're fusing. And as you can imagine, millennials are the most fused generation. And I cannot wait to move on to Generation Z to see if it's even more, more impactful. So this is um, our image for work-life fusion, which is everything. And I just wanted to read a few things out of the book that I've written about fusion, because it's just more articulate than me starting from scratch. Work-life fusion is the newest form of work-life management. It's perfectly tailored for a technological age and fully customizable based on the needs of digital workers. So ultimately, it is really your choice how you leverage the technology. Essentially, work and life have fused through technology, and this has re-landscaped everything, including the workplace. People are taking work and life systems and using technology as the means to merge them into a single fused system, which is stronger and more sustainable. So it allows them to keep things balanced. So this is what we know. Boomer's natural exposure to technology was at home. It was the television, the television and the telephone, right? Um, but not really that much at work for a lot of years. Um, it was kind of like the computer came into work, but the, the boomers were already there, right? Um, Gen Xers saw some technology at home, and then the introduction of technology outside the home. Um, I think I was in high school the first time I ever saw a computer on a rolling cart. They rolled one computer down the hall, and we all got to press one key. That was all we were allowed to do. So that was the first time I ever saw a computer in my school. Um, and, then, and then when I got to, to college and the workplace, there were some. In fact, I worked at Xerox at the time that Global View, which was the first um, kind of the dawn of the whole internet and the, the email and the web started. So that was pretty neat. Um, millennials were exposed to technology in the crib. I mean, they were, really, they were starting to create um, all kinds of interactive type toys. They saw this technology at school and, and then pretty much everywhere. In fact, by the time I think, they, I think millennials were carrying devices to middle school, if I'm not mistaken. They were already carrying a device with them. So that's pretty interesting. So this is what's happening. The shift is that we're constantly connected to our life. We don't go to work and then just turn everything off. We're checking in a lot of the time. And millennials check in more than, um, more than Gen Xers and boomers do. Um, the freedom and autonomy is the important part. We've talked to millennials who have said th that, um, and actually some of you probably, I, I've actually sent them around uh, my organization as well, the little questionnaires handwritten saying, how would you feel about this? If you couldn't get to technology or you could get to technology, how would that change how you feel about your job? Um, I also did this with students and other millennials. And what we found was that the two things that were really interesting. Quantitatively, when we ask questions about balancing work and life, the questions that we asked about separating work and life, they didn't even register statistically with millennials because they were picking the middle circle, which was like, I have no opinion. They didn't even know what that meant. Literally was not significant to them that there was such an option as to not be doing both at the same time. So I thought that was fascinating. And I stared at those results for a while, trying to figure out why is this coming out like this? And what we found out was it's because it's, so, it's such a normal for them to be checking on everything, right? And that's kind of the way that we're doing it now, that it, 
It didn't even compute to them to answer the question, what do you mean? What do you mean separate work and life? What does that even mean? Um, so millennials don't try to separate. It's very normal for them. I think that uh, the older generations can do it. I don't like doing it. I love technology. I'm all about checking in on whatever I can. But if I had to, I could definitely do that. Um, disconnecting from technology. Millennials have been quoted as saying, I would feel sick if I couldn't get on my social media or check my phone. I would feel stressed. I would feel sick. I would have to leave my job. Like They would feel unwell. And there are studies on that. I haven't gone that far. But there are studies on wellness that have to do with this. Um, we can do without if we need to. Boomers can do without if they need to. Setting up meetings in advance. So when I grew up, my dad was on a bowling club. Right? Or you joined a golf club, it's like a set meeting every week. Or if you had to have a business meeting, you planned it in advance. A lot of times, the setting the meetings up in advance, the younger generations are doing it. They don't see a need to do it because you've got your phone right here. And we can just quickly, right? we can go on GroupMe really quick and say, hey, is everybody available? And then spontaneously have a meeting. Um, but they do it because socially, we have to all be able to communicate with one another. Um, setting up a meeting, doing something after work or, or going to a park, that happens pretty instantaneously with the younger generations. In fact, my husband mentioned that he went out to L.A. Um, last year to meet my nephew, who's, uh, I think he's a, he was 26, so millennial. And he said, I was asking them all day, where are we meeting and at what time? And all day long he wasn't hearing anything. And then he found out um, as he was on the train heading toward this park, now the messages started rolling in because it was so fluid until it was starting to formulate at the exact time where everyone's going to be. Where are you? What are you walking toward? What do you see? So um, pretty interesting. So it's become a little bit more flexible. So how does that impact people and organizations? Well, what we looked at was how does this technology, this work-life fusion, which is the technology allowing us to check in on everything and take care of work and life management simultaneously, how does that affect what the researchers call psychological job control? I call it freedom and autonomy because that's really what it is. How does that affect us? How much do we need the technology? And ultimately, how does that impact how happy we are with our work-life satisfaction. That means, do we feel grounded and well-balanced? And how does it impact how we like our jobs? If we're allowed to be at work and be checking in on all of these things, if we're given the freedom, each and every one of us, to do it, to, to balance things the way we want, um, how is that going to affect us? And it's really important because people who are happy at their jobs, right? They don't leave their jobs. They don't quit. Um, and their quality of life goes up, they become more productive. And if we understand each other, that's the goal of blending systems, right? We all understand each other's characteristics and what our needs are. Um, we can reduce negative interactions as well. So this is the goal. This is what the book is about. And what we did was we looked at, we said, OK, so psychological job control is freedom and autonomy. So. We want to be free. And then I added into the middle of the model the work-life satisfaction with the life satisfaction. So it ends up being three variables. It's am I genuinely, oops, sorry. Am I genuinely happy? Do I feel grounded, like I'm catering or tending to all of my work and my family or personal life at the proper degree or level? And then am I happy in my job? Um, and all of these depend on who you are. So our new normal today is that, yes, we do this differently, not incorrectly, not wrongly. Um, and we do learn at a different pace. And, and this is really important. How we're learning the technology, just because we don't leverage the technologies the same way, doesn't mean that we don't want to learn the technology. I have had individuals say to me in interviews, um, I'm really interested in learning the technology, but I'm not hardwired the way a young person is. I mean, my, we've all said that we hand our phone over, right? The youngest person in the room gets the phone. Can you make this stop doing this? Or make my phone do that? And I, you know, my mother just signed up for Facebook, and she doesn't know what she did wrong. And I, I said, you need to go get my niece who lives down the street and go get her to fix it for you. I can't talk you through this over the phone. Um, so 
we all want to learn, and I actually got her on Instagram, and it took me a really long time to explain how to work the Instagram, but here's the thing, you can get really frustrated, but it doesn't matter who you are. You may not have those connections and learn things quickly, but you're still curious, you're still interested, and I think what is important is we need to understand that everyone learns these things differently at a different pace. It doesn't mean we're not interested, and it doesn't mean we're dumb. So I've had millennials say, oh my gosh, he takes so long. I, I, he asked me like 100 questions. And then the person on the other side is saying, well, it was like I was allowed to ask three questions and then I was stupid and I wasn't allowed to ask anymore. But I really wanted to learn the tool. The tool. So we've got this, this high level of curiosity and um, maybe a lower level of, of patience this, on one side of the scenario. So what's important is we learn at different paces but we're still curious and we want to leverage the technology. So we have to be patient with the differences. Answer a million questions if you have to, because somebody might be um, genuinely interested and just not actually understand how the device works um, and help each other. Don't roll your eyes. And the same goes for when we have the, you know, the younger individuals working for us and um, they're going too quickly. One of my favorite things is that we have so many different approaches to tasks and relationships. Um, some are more, we're, we're more instrumental with the things that we try to do. We try to check them off the list. And others, we try to spend a lot more time creating a quality product. Neither one of those approaches is wrong, right? It depends on the, the context and what you're trying to achieve. And so my goal is always to say, let's cultivate this strength of getting many things done at once in a day uh, when it's needed, and then cultivate that other strength, that attention to detail, quality, and cross-mentor one another to, we can, we can do it this way on, in this particular scenario, or we can do it the other way. So um, helping each other, I think, is critical. Supporting a technological environment at work, developing competencies is really about learning from each other, right? Understanding what is critical. Um, everyone agrees, it's interesting, all three generations that I looked at agree that we don't necessarily have to be face to face to get things done. As long as we have email, and this is really interesting, the boomers love Skype and FaceTime. That's like important to them. They still need to see the face. Whereas the younger generations are okay with just the words, the I Ming. Um, it's really interesting that the boomers really want to see, they want to see you. I think it's, I don't know if it's about reading facial expressions or what, but I thought that was so interesting that we're all fine with, it was the one thing we all agree on is, yeah, we don't need to be physically in a room, right? We love the, the, the dialing in or remote or whatever, I, dialing in is dating myself, but remote connect, right? We all love that because it gives us a little bit more, more autonomy if we can't be in the same place and we're geographically dispersed in most, most organizations now. Um, but it's pretty neat. We all agree on that. Um, what's interesting is the only generation that needs social media at work and gets really, really stressed out and feels like they don't have freedom and autonomy are the younger generations, right? So the millennials feel very, um, very constrained in the workplace if they cannot check in on the social media. So that's where we end with this being that really, that really strong shift toward a fused environment. It's not comfortable for them, and they are not comfortable in a workplace where that is not allowed. And that's important for employers to know that they need you to trust them, and they need the autonomy. And there are studies, and I have not gone this far, but there are studies on um, is, is the work getting done? If we're letting this happen, are they being productive? So there are a lot of productivity studies. I'm not looking at productivity studies because um, I was really just, I was tired of, do you remember uh, Maury Sofer? He did, a, he did a, um, a talk or one of his news reports and it was on the millennials are coming. And I really took offense to that because I was really tired of all of these articles and news reports about the millennials are taking the workplace by storm, like they're, like they're awful. And so I guess that was me looking at those types of reports and saying, wow, I'm tired of us looking at these differences and saying, oh my gosh, because it's different or there's a change, this can't all be good, right? So we all need development, but I think it's important to understand that the changes are not going to be 
all negative and millennials feel that. There's some really great websites that millennials have put together where they feel the, um, that pushback of, oh my gosh, they're not doing it right or they're, they're shaking up what, the status quo, what we've always done. And I think it's just really important to be vigilant and adaptive to the fact that there are more and more people coming in and we're all different and how we approach things is going to be different. Um, and organizations need to know that. We need to develop competencies so that we all understand each other. The policies need to be um, such that it supports your ability to check in if you need to check in. I actually had um, one person I knew that at the bottom right of their screen, they had their dog in doggy daycare, and they actually had a webcam at the doggy daycare, and while she was doing her work, she could check in on her dog, and I, I thought that was so cute. Um, so the successful interactions, the reduced stress, and the reduced turnover, I mean, it's sort of like enough said. These are important things, but I think it's, the whole book is based on the fact that, and, and it's, it's written in a less researchy way. It's hard for me to divorce myself from the research, but um, the way the book is written, it's meant to be entertaining for you, um, kind of laugh at your personal um, experiences, and then kind of laugh also at other people's personal experiences. So in the book, I tell stories about me growing up, like being, you know, the Gen Xers, we were latch kid key, or latch key kids, and so my story in the book is I, I literally had a, a key, a house key safety pinned to my undershirt when I was in, I think I was in first grade, and I was going home alone because my mom had gotten a secretarial job. That was, you know, just as women were really starting to head out and, and, um, and get jobs. And so I was coming home to an empty house. And I remember reading about that and years and years ago, reading about that and thinking, oh my gosh, that was a thing? I thought that was just me. And that my mother did that because she was just, she didn't trust me to not, but apparently that's a thing, latchkey kid. And, and that was me. And so I tried to add those stories in to make it more interesting. Um, ultimately, let's see, I've got a few more quotes in here that I can share. And, um, One's on the millennials. So the shift for millennials. Overall, texting and social media are essential for millennials at work when it comes to staying connected to personal life. Without the ability to text or check social media, a millennial will be dissatisfied with his job and extremely stressed. And we did find that. Um, as people utilize new technology in their jobs, organizational policies continue to develop around what is or isn't appropriate in the workplace. Policies which, if restrictive, can greatly affect an employee's job satisfaction. These policies affect generational groups differently and impact how people understand each other at work. So to foster productivity and teamwork, we have to strive to have a shared understanding of how we approach work and life. So let's see. Let's, let's conclude with change is upon us. <laughs> this is the beginning of the book, but it's, it seemed like a good closing. Change is upon us, and no matter your generation, we're all adapting. For more than a century, we've managed to keep our work separate from both our personal life and our personal identities, but that time has passed. Work and life have collided. The age of work-life fusion is upon us. So as we move forward, we're just going to continue to kind of look at this phenomenon and see what happens, and I would love your input and any questions that you have. I don't know everything about it. I just continue to research um, how we all react to technology and our needs um, in the hopes that we will all be just open-minded about people who do it differently than we do it. So thank you for your time. Questions, I'll come around with the microphone so that the question gets recorded as well as the answer. <laughs> uh, thanks for that interesting uh, presentation. I was interested in the uh, early graph chart of the millennials and uh, different approaches to technology, and I, and I saw that it's from 2005, and, and if you ask my millennial son, he wouldn't touch email if, unless he had to. He's, right. It's all texting. Exactly. It's interesting because when I, I don't remember which chart you're talking about. Is it this one or? No, the next one, I think. Um, it's interesting because when I was asking those questions on the survey, 
I realized that because everything goes to the handheld device now, it's not even, um, it's seamless, whether it's a text message or an email. It's not, so I think in his world, getting an email means I'm going over to my computer and I'm logging into whatever, but now it comes straight to your phone, right? So the emails and the chatting and the IMing, it's all going to the phone. So yeah, they just want to chat. What's the point of having to do an email? So that's interesting. So from your research, the millennials um, need to be able to be connected to their non-work life while they're at work. Do they also need to be connected to their work life when they are not at work? Absolutely. So for for the millennials, there's no there's no there's no change or domain barrier. They just it's they're doing it all at the same time. So yes, um, if you were to talk about like work productivity, you can argue that yes, they may leave right at 4:30 and maybe they checked in on their their personal life for who knows how long during the day, but ultimately they're also checking in when they get home on their, their work as, all, as well. So I don't know if it evens out because I haven't done that research, but that's what I mean by fusion is for, for that group and probably the younger group, there's, there's no such thing as checking out of one or the other. You're, you're kind of just always there checking in. So we'd have to study that. Hello, Millennial here. Um, Hi, Millennial. <laughs> so I guess um, being that we're at a university and I'm a student and there's a lot of um, talk and research going on about the use of technology in the classroom. And I've been in classrooms where um, the professors completely banned the usage of technology and I've been in others where they want you to tweet in class. And mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering what the connection is between um, you know, going from higher education or just education in general into the workforce and um, I guess the similarities that we're seeing in education with the usage of technology in the younger generation. That's really interesting um, because honestly, about, I don't know, 15 years ago, when, when students really started in higher ed to bring those phones to school, um, it drove me crazy. I'm, I'm telling you the truth, it drove me crazy if they weren't looking at me while I was teaching. And I would say that. I would say, put your phone away. And it, would, it, would, it stressed me out that they were on their phone. So here, here you, it's sort of that bi-directional thing where um, the millennials are stressed out because they can't get on it. And I was really stressed out because they were getting on it. And I was feeling it, it distracted me that they weren't paying attention. I felt very, because as an educator, you do. You feel very responsible for the outcome in the classroom. So. To kind of give you both sides of it, the, I would imagine the educators that are doing that are feeling very responsible for the, the, the learning outcomes. That's our job. What I started to do was, you might call it part of flip the classroom, because um, I never thought of it that way, but it just popped into my head. What I've done is uh, allowed the students, no matter what their age is, but typically millennial right now, um, to take ownership of their learning outcomes by not telling them to get off their phones but making a mental note of who is on their phone so that when they end up in my office and they need extra help, I say, if you weren't on your phone so much, this might not be a problem. It's so that they know, like, I see you. I'm not writing it down, but I'm watching you when you're on your phone. And every now and then, if I see somebody so engrossed in their phone that they, that they don't even know they're in the room anymore, I, it's so that I can get this close to them without them even noticing, I'll say, you want to put that away? And I only do that if I see that they, they're not self-regulating, but I've kind of flipped it. I can't say honestly that um, it's still a personal thing per educator. And so probably this type of education and understanding could be of benefit. Um, just to help, but I think it's a personal, it's, you know, so, so Reza, what do you do? You don't care, right? Okay. You don't care? I've, I've worked, so, so um, what generation are you in? I'm not millennial, but uh, you're, pretty close. You're ge pretty close to, so you're Gen X? Yes. So, so I'm at one end of the Gen X, like I just made it in, I brag all the time that yes. I made it into Gen X. Uh, my husband is a, is a boomer, he's the, he's the last boomer, and my dad's the first boomer, and it's just so funny because I'm like, I'm married to a boomer. 
Um, so, but we would be different even because we're at what I not you're not all the way at the end, but you're definitely younger no. than I am, and you don't care. And I've had to teach myself not to care right. about it. And I don't uh, take it, attendance, and uh, I mentioned that they show up to the class more, and when they're in the class, they pay very close attention. When I push them to do it, which I did it before, a lot of the students are just on the phone, but when I don't push them to come to class, when they are there, they are there and they uh, pay close attention. So the ones who voluntarily arrive in the yes. classroom, and that I'm still taking attendance. Yes. But I don't <laughs> care about their phones, but it's like baby steps. It's hard for me, it hurts to not make sure they're there. But yes. so I'll try that, I'm gonna give that a try. Um, Professor Haker, I'm wondering, I'm thinking that there are some, oops, there's some uh, work environments where this kind of, these, these different styles, these, these, this work-life fusion might become, might come more to a head. That might, might, there might be more mm -hmm. conflict. I'm thinking the medical hospital environments, like where yep, That's things, absolutely where it does. Yeah, yeah, so I was just wondering if you, if your survey sort of reflects it or if you're thinking about sort of whether your advice would be different for some of those different work environments. So it's really interesting that you say that because my very first qualitative study was mostly hospitals and that's absolutely where it is and it's for a couple of reasons. One, I found that there were a lot more traditionals still in medicine. Um, nurses don't, didn't retire as early um, as in some professions and there were very, very young people as well working at the desks, the check-in desks and things like that in hospitals. And they were, the, the qualitative, that, so I had recordings of the interviews are comical when you hear, they're like, they're just disgusted because someone's checking their phone and they're making those, that's where they're making the limitations on, put your phone away, you can't have your phone out. And, and then we had the younger doctors would come in, that not, not quite millennial doctors, but not, maybe not the, at the traditional level. They would complain to the doctors and the doctor would say, well, as long as they're getting their job done, I guess I'm okay with them checking in as long as it's productive, but if it's, you know, they're obsessed and they just, certain people didn't want it at all and others were like, well, in moderation. Um, in the technological field, interestingly enough, there was like no, no gaps at all. Everybody is savvy. So if you're in tech and IT, everyone is savvy. So there are no disconnects. It doesn't, it's really interesting. It, um, it kind of, when you're in IT, it transcends age. The, the whole, all of the characteristics are similar because they're all tech savvy. So they're all using the technology. And it was interesting because no one had a problem with, and they were kind of all fused. It didn't matter the age. So that would be like one side of the spectrum to the other. Isn't that mostly because they're they're working with technology like mm -hmm. a child? If you work in a hospital, it's a lot of people skills, a lot of comprehension yeah. of what's going on, unexpected things, you know, emergencies. Mm -hmm. You can't be distracted by your Yeah, that's a good argument. Yeah. Totally different. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point. I mean there there are some contexts where it's just not appropriate your phone and, and your phone should not be out right and then in other contexts it's just a natural thing so yeah you're not wrong what about laptops in the classroom because I actually took a course here at Cornell extramurally mm -hmm. and at the beginning of the semester this the professor said no one can use laptops. I think the concern was they were going to be surfing the net and not paying attention was hmm. the concern. And here I'm, a, I guess you could say I'm a Zennial okay. because I was born in 75. Okay. So I, I'm kind of like a cross between a Gen Xer and a Millennial, mm -hmm. I guess is what the term is. I don't know what that Zennial is. I never heard of that. Means. I was actually going to white it out because I'd never heard of it. But if, if you notice on the page, it overlaps. So I don't know what it is. I have to look it up. I've never yeah. heard of that before. But um, it overlaps with, where is that? That back here? Yeah. So yeah. this overlaps with, with this one and this one. So I don't know what it is. I have to research it. But so anyway, um, so how did you feel about that, not being able to use the laptop? With me, that was fine because I well through high school. We had mm -hmm. to take notes in a notebook. We didn't have the computers and laptops and things yeah. like that. So that wasn't a huge adjustment for me. But then about halfway through the semester, the professor finally apparently they had a Students lot, were having had a a lot of feedback where mm -hmm. they wanted to use their laptops to take notes. Right. So she let them take notes after that. That's here, interesting. I fine with that. I mean, so my students well. come into a computer lab and they still have their laptops open. And I'm, I'm, I'm over it. 
I don't want to be policing all of that. It's, I, I had a, it took me long enough to get used to the phones, um, and now I don't police the laptops. If they want to be on their email or whatever they want to be on, how I feel is, this is your learning journey. You need to own it, you know? And I tell them that at the beginning, and I'm doing my best. I'm still taking attendance because I just can't stop doing that. I need to make sure they're in the room because of the type of course that I teach. That might be it because it's very hands-on. Um, but I've kind of, it's really, that's another, really another separate study, right? Releasing yourself from that feeling of um, why do you feel you need to control that, the technology that's in the room, whether it's a workplace or a classroom. Um, understanding why people need to feel that they need to do that. Because there are some true justifications for it. For me, the, the taking attendance and making sure they're in the room and submitting work in the classroom is about um, the muscle memory required to be able to do spreadsheet modeling. Um, I don't know. I just, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So I'm, I'm in a degree program, so oh, okay, I'm, good. I'm taking a lot of classes. So tell us. Tell and us so about it. And so one of the things that is amazing to me is that, um, and maybe this, you've studied some of this and, or not, but the, the multitasking, the idea that they can they keep doing things even though we know it's micro switching. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, I'll, sit, I'll be sitting next to a student who's got their laptop open, they're surfing Facebook, they're doing this, they're looking at flowers, they're doing, and then they'll ask a spot on question. Exactly. to the professor. They are here, some of them, not all of them, mm -hmm. but some, they're hearing everything That's right. while doing this. And I, I, I'm amazed if I've got anything, if I'm trying to even type or even take notes sometimes, I've missed two or three sentences exactly. in trying to get that. And that's, all, that's a whole neurological study, right? Because that's all about um, the connections and understanding the technology. Um, the, way, the way younger people who were immersed in technology at birth understand technology, you can hand them a device they've never had in their hand before and they are intuitive enough to figure out how the device works because of how other devices work. And I'm fascinated by that. And I think that somewhere in that brain development is that ability to compartmentalize. Now I get the same thing and I get the opposite of that in my class as well as what you just said, which is I go to the back of the room and somebody asks me, a, and always the farther back in the room you go, the more they've been on their, their personal stuff. So um, I go in and and he'll say, he'll ask, somebody will ask me something that I almost a second ago just said. And I'll say, did you not just, and I will say that without, you know, being rude. I want them to be cognizant. You just missed something. So I'll say, did you not just hear me go over that with this, on the screen five minutes ago? I just went through that to let them know. And then they'll say, oh, no, I did, and I missed that. And then I'll, I'll go back over it again. But, but you're right. They, they have an amazing... There, you probably already know, right, that these little kids who can't speak, little 18-month-old, one-year-old kids who can't even speak, they can navigate the iPad. And they always say, you know, we always heard that your vocal cords don't form as fast as the rest of your brain, and that's proof because they can navigate an iPad and communicate with you before they can even talk now. It's almost scary. Like, I was on an airplane um, yesterday, and it's, it's bizarre. Like, you're just watching this little tiny thing who seems like we're so used to them being little and not be able to talk, and, and they're just like doing, and you're just like, oh my gosh, this is like a, not even a year and a half year old child. So it's pretty fascinating. You mentioned that you were excited to see what the next generations bring. So I guess, do you think there's any chance that it won't continue on the same trend? And also, if you had to add some more columns onto your chart about the characteristics, what do you imagine would be there? Um, I think absolutely. I think we're just going to shift into complete fusion because the more technology that's there, and think about the technology they're forecasting that we're going to have is um, it's just amazing, right? So I don't see how we won't be checking in. And I think that what I am excited to do as well, not only to add this new generation, it's to go back and make this more longitudinal and go back and recheck on the same generations to see if the longer the age groups have been immersed in technology throughout the years, have they, right? Because it, there's so many other factors here, right? Life stage, there's so many different things that it could be. It's not just your generation, but I want to see, is it also about how long you've been exposed to the technologies? And are we getting better at learning them, teaching each other how to use them, et cetera? Um, characteristics to add, do you mean for work characteristics or? Hmm. 
Hmm, I never thought about that. That's a really good question. Other characteristics that I would add in. Well, that, that um, career as a passion project is really an important one. Um, so how uh, I think a, a, ca a category on what people consider a fulfilling career is really important. Um, so it, it would be interesting to know if we're all moving toward um, the passion projects and, and they're, they're touching people or if that's just um, certain age groups. I think that's important to know. Um, I don't know. What, what characteristics are we missing on this table? Well, I think the form of communication, um, just because we're using technology doesn't mean it's the same. I mm -hmm. just, just read an article the other day about like one of the, the difficulties Facebook is having is that the Gen Z kids do not want to be on it. And I've right. talked to my little siblings about this, 14 mm -hmm. and 16 years old, and they're getting a Snapchat every two minutes, right. but they refuse to ever make a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. you know, just what is it, what is it that one type of technology offers in terms of connectivity to mm -hmm. the rest of the world versus the other and the benefits that you can get from that? And that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about in terms of Yeah, that's of really fusion. interesting. So I didn't, I didn't want to give the punchline away <laughs> of the book, but in the book, what I end up doing is the, the third and the last study that I did most recently um, basically breaks up the technologies by generation and by um, what technologies are being leveraged for work at work, what technologies are being leveraged to check in on your personal life when you're at work, which ones do you absolutely require, meaning you feel free and autonomous, meaning you're not stressed or you would be stressed if you didn't have it, um, and which ones are just convenience items. And so um, don't, don't flip to the back of the book, but read the book. It's, it, uh, this was designed, by the way, um, so my millennial um, writer, co-author um, is also big into Kindle analytics and this was designed as one of those books that for a lot of us who are not having time to read this book was designed to first of all it's written by me but in millennial speak and you'll notice that it's awkward for me to read um, but also it's written so that you could read it in a weekend maybe a few hours depending on how how much you like to read and it's meant to be entertaining and tell a story. And at the end, there's a summary that tells you, for boomers and millennials, because they're diametrically opposed, um, what things they're leveraging for work versus life and what things they absolutely must have, meaning they would leave a job because they were stressed if they didn't have it, and which ones are just really convenient to have. Um, so that's in there. Um, but that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that input. That's really, really useful. Um, yeah. Okay. Sure. Oh, thank you for interesting uh, speaking. So maybe my uh, my question uh, answer of my question is in this book. But mm -hmm. so uh, I'm a millennial, but I personally not good at using SNS, and I I actually don't wanna, uh, want to leave my phone for anywhere. <laughs> but uh, now I strongly feel that I should understand the person who uh, get used to using the phone. So. If you know, could you tell me why they uh, get satisfied when they are restricted to use their phone, like uh, get used to, uh, I mean, it's custom for them and they don't want to change their lifestyles mm -hmm. or they feel anxious uh, when they don't contact to their friends or something like that? Yeah, so in my study, what I did was I studied what we call, um, I can go back to the model, it's called psychological job control. It's such a big researchy word. But all that means is, um, do you feel that your employer is uh, giving you the freedom to get your work done the way you want to get it done? So if we've all heard that, we're, oh, that guy's a micromanager, or she's, a, she's always hovering over me, telling me what to do. We want autonomy. We want our boss to tell us what to do, and we want them to go away. And we'll get the job done, because we're not stupid. We're, we want to know how to do it. We, we know how to do it, and we're going to do it. So what we found when we were doing the research was, so I changed that to be called freedom and autonomy because that's, more, that's a warmer term than psychological job control. And um, doesn't it sound crazy? It sounds like a horror film. And, um, and so what we found was that that need to be connected um, re was a, a stressor. So not being able to connect to those things and check into the personal life or even use your technology to get your work done was making uh, the younger generations feel that they did not have the freedom and autonomy to make the choices they wanted to make. 
and to choose what they were going to leverage. So I didn't go any deeper than that. I didn't really get into the why are you stressed out. I just got into um, some qualitative interviews where they said, oh my gosh, I would feel sick. if I, I, th I don't know if you were here earlier when I started, but I, they were saying I would feel sick if I, I couldn't do that. And some is because they feel so connected to the personal life, they need to check in on it. So they're super social. Um, and some of it is that they really want the autonomy. They want to feel that they have the flow to choose, the freedom to choose how they do things. So. Thank you. <laughs> this has been a production of Cornell University Library.